Oh, geez. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on here. All right. <clears throat> so like I said, I like to go over the perspectives um, assignment that you had on Friday. Some good stuff here. Some good stuff. So I wanted you to read these these primary resources here and then fill out on the graphic organizer what they had to say. Did anybody read the wrath, the day of wrath? This was this was good information about a, a precursor before you got to these primary sources. And uh, it's just interesting, like I said, to read about some, some of these uh, these events and what actually went on. So follow along here. I'll be asking people some questions as we move through it. Charles Murdinger. OK, so. Who was Charles Murdinger? What battleship was he on? Describe Charles Murdinger's perspective of the events. So that kind of gives gives it away who he was, what side he was on. Troy, what do you have for Charles Murdinger? You want to answer those two questions? He was on the USS Nevada. Yeah, good job. So the USS Nevada, so he's on the United States side. And uh, he probably was surprised about this this uh, this event here. Go ahead. He was trapped on the ship with the bombing. Yeah, good job. So when he came up to the top, uh, when he actually looked outside, what did he describe it as? Do you remember? Like, do you remember his quote, uh, what he said? It was like almost, I think he described it almost as like hell, right? It was just fire everywhere. Like he couldn't even see the, the rise in the sky. It was just complete fire and destruction and smoke uh, that he could see and that he, that he could visualize when he came up to the deck of the boat. And uh, I couldn't imagine that, right? Uh, obviously, he was in a naval ship. It was early in the morning, and uh, he probably thought it was just a, a routine like usual. And all of a sudden, these attacks happened. He got up out of, you know, he saved some people up out of the deck. He's like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? He's probably still in shock. And then he visualizes and sees all the smoke and fire. It was like almost like a movie or something for him, I bet. And uh, it was just complete destruction all around him. Good, good job. So his, his experience of the event, obviously, in devastation as he was totally surprised by this attack by the Japanese. He was a part of the United States, obviously, on the naval ship Nevada. And, uh, yeah, and I thought that was interesting what he said. It was like like he was in hell, like how he described it as. It was just fire and smoke everywhere he looked. Okay, it was almost like he was blinded in a way. Okay, and uh, that was a good description and experience of that event. All right, Abe Zenchi. So he was actually on oh, back in 2010, 9, 8, something like that. I, I can't remember now. Uh, it was early 2000s anyway, maybe mid-2000s, where he actually came on the news and talked about his perspective of, of uh, Pearl Harbor and, you know, what he experienced and, you know, what he was thinking. And it was pretty cool. So maybe I can find that clip and post it on the announcement for you to check out. I thought it was cool because we just, you know, obviously you read about him and he was on the news not, well, I guess it would be more than a decade now. I'm talking about it now. I'm thinking about it. But. All right. So who was Abe Zenchi? What did he do during the Pearl Harbor event? And describe Abe Zenchi's perspective of the event. What do we have for Abe? Gracie, go ahead. He was a dive bomb pilot and he was on the ship during the attack. Yeah, good job. Good job. So he was part of the Japanese. Okay, he was dive bombing and uh, he was describing his perspective of the event. What did he say about it? Do you remember? He said it was hard to see the ships in a big ship and he was starting to attack. And he said that he's seen about 300 bombs exploding on the ground later. He found out that the ship he attacked first was the Arizona. Okay, Arizona. We know that one was the devastating one. Uh, I, I believe still there underneath the harbor. And uh, where that memorial set up and established there at Pearl Harbor. Good, good. So Zenchi later goes on and describes his perspective of looking at the event, you know, after everything unfolded. And um, he just kind of detailed how, you know, during warfare, it you, you can't feel remorse or sadness about what happened. But when he was thinking about it after the fact, he just couldn't believe what devastation took hold there. And uh, he's almost felt a pit of sorrow in a way. And uh, kind of how his government, how Japan was forcing their people to attack these, you know, just people and that the significance of the event, the total deaths. And he has extreme sorrow for many 
many of the things that he did on that day, December 7th, 1941. And I believe now he's pretty good friends with some of these people on the American side, as it was described in his perspective. And, and uh, it's interesting how even after this event, many of these individuals can come together and not forget about it. But it's like, hey, we were part of it. You know, obviously, we were, we were told to do an objectives, complete the objective. And after the war, they kind of come together there. I'm sure there's a little bit of animosity towards each other. But after a while, I guess. You know, in this case, friendships were built. And it's interesting how that kind of comes together. You know, you think about it after a sporting event, you might have friends on the other side. It's like, well, when you're on the field, when you're performing, you got to go against them, right? You got to compete against them. But then after the game, you kind of put things aside. I guess it's similar in warfare, but to the extreme, right? To the extreme. Okay, I guess that's a way we can relate it to sports or activities that we do but this is way way more impactful i guess right all right k and frank frank the tank i'm just kidding k and frank tremaine so describe k and frank's perspective of the event why were they there what happened here what happened here forney what do you got for k and frank uh they were civilian the purple pearl harbor during the attack um when the attack first started they thought it was just a drill and thought nothing of it until they got a call saying that it wasn't the drill. And they went outside to watch what was happening with Pearl Harbor. Yeah, good job. So at first, uh, at first they thought it was just a drill. And, and I think in this perspective here, they, they explained how it was almost foreshadowing, right? That the night before this event happened, I think they're at some sort of party, right? I think it was this perspective. Maybe it was the other one. I think it was this one. And they're at like some sort of party, and, and uh, it was almost foreshadowing. I think Frank looked at the horizon, and because uh, the sky was like lit, like an orange coloring, he said, "Oh wow, it looks like there's that de looks like there's destruction going on. It looks like there was just a battle that just happened, you know, in the sky, just the way it looks, how orange it is, and you know, it looks like there's fire in the horizon." And then the next day, Pearl Harbor happens. It's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he said that. And it seemed like he knew what was going to happen. Like he knew what devastating event was going to occur and all the fire and the flame smoke that was, gonna, that was going to uh, later occur. And I thought that was interesting how he described that and how he talked about it. Yeah, so they were civilians there. They had no idea. And like I mentioned before, there's a lot of military training and and uh, different routines going on. So when they heard the attack at first, they're like, ah, it's just another training exercise. It is what it is. But after they got report, they just couldn't believe what happened. Right? Good, good. So Kay and Frank. All right. Elizabeth McIntosh. What do we have here for this one? What do we have for this one? Kira, what do you got? Yeah, so she was a reporter. She was describing what was going on. Obviously, she wasn't there for the event. Well, she was there for the event, but she wasn't. She was sent before it. So she was supposed to be just talking about the military base, discussing what was going on, reporting back to, you know, uh, obviously Honolulu and then later to the nation, you know, continental United States. But this impact happened. And oh boy, did she get a good story, right? Holy cow. And uh, describe her perspective. What do you have here for Kira? Um, I said that she saw a dead body over the hall. That's what she wrote. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think she wrote, too, where she was just confused. She thought it was an invasion, right? She thought at any moment or any time that these Japanese troops and soldiers would be marching up over the hills and taking hold of the whole island there, right, and the whole area of Pearl Harbor. And that she knew that sooner or later it was probably going to happen. That she was just waiting for it to occur. Uh, she didn't think it was just a bombing run. That was just destruction that was going to happen with uh, the Air Force. She thought it was going to be a total invasion of the Japanese uh, army. Yeah. I think at one point she even mentioned, oh, that was the Germans. Like, I couldn't believe like they came all the way across the Pacific. No way. Right? So, yeah, that was interesting perspectives here. Is there any questions on that, guys? So like I said, if you didn't do it, I feel bad for you because uh, many of these perspectives are interesting. I think it's important for us to learn and talk about and, and uh, you know really read about because many of these people are long gone. Okay, Once they're gone, their story's gone too. 
So it's important to pick up a book, pick up a magazine, an article, and read people's stories about their experiences during an event and uh, detail about their perspectives. Okay, uh, so whenever you have the chance, you see something like that or see someone, or, uh, someone that was a part of an event, uh, make sure you reach out to them, talk about them. Uh, obviously, with warfare, be a little bit, uh, you know, be, be acknowledged of maybe it's a hard, difficult thing to talk about for many of these people. So uh, I know with my grandfather, he was in World War II. I didn't really try to talk about it too much, and I was really young before he passed away. But um, I, I would always ask him these questions, like, ah, "I'll tell you, tell you another time, tell you another time," and you know, just kind of be worried, worry about what they might, that, what it might bring back as a flashback for these people. So, yep, there you go. So primary resources, people that were actually at the event, firsthand account. All right. Good stuff there. So the Pacific Theater map, i like you to open this up. We'll go through it together. And if you didn't do this, which many of you didn't, uh, follow through with it. Label the, label the countries, the bodies of water. And I'd like you to color these countries red. Okay, these areas red where Japanese Imperial Japan expanded by 1942. So you might have to look up a map. You might have to look as reference of what they actually controlled. So yeah, it wasn't totally all of China, it was a part of it. So you can reference it to a map that you find in 1942, okay? If you want to, you can submit that map that, you know, here's where I got it, here's where I looked at it. Okay, there you go. All right, so number one, USSR, what number are they? This one's easy here. Kiara, what do you got for the USSR, the Soviet Union? 11? Oh. Holy cow. I just Wait, what? 11? Where? Well, okay, A. Oh, I do see two 11s here, yeah. Yeah, I got to change that here. Sorry about that. Yeah, this one shouldn't be. But anyway, USSR, Soviet Union, shouldn't be 11. This is up here, Soviet Union, number one. Yeah, so when you're looking at the map... Uh, we all know the Soviet Union is a Eurasian country, right? It expands across Europe, well, part into Europe and all over Asia. So when we're looking at it, this is the location on the map that you're seeing. So it might be hard to see since it's a white map. I get I that. Saw it was a big thing. Yeah, yeah. So number one, Soviet Union. It's right up here if you're looking at it, like this area right here. Okay. All right. So we all know that is not the industrial areas of of the Soviet Union. The industrial areas, the larger cities are located more closer towards Europe, right? So it's more isolated, remote. I guess you could say there's some areas where there's resources being extracted, raw materials, but for the most part, the industrial areas, the cities, the larger areas are located here closer towards Europe. This is more just like a remote, uh, really just areas where raw materials and resources are mined and extracted. Okay. Two, Japan. What number do we have? Troy, go ahead. Six. Six, good work. So the island nation of Japan, okay, and we know by 1942 they're a little bit larger. They have a lot more area, a lot more land, territory, but the island nation of Japan, six. Good work. All right, three, Midway, not the grocery store back in, you know, Higgins Valley View area before Redner's moved in. What do we have here for that one? Griffin? No, we don't have that one. Kiara, you said it earlier. 11. Good job. So 11 right here, midway. It's right in the middle, smack dab in the middle of the Pacific, okay, between really the United States and Japan. Midway Islands. Okay, good, good. They're really not. There's a couple military bases there. That's about, about it, right? Okay. Four. China, what do we have? What do we have here? Lentz, what do you got? Where's China at? Five, good work. Five, China right here. Good, good. So Japan expanding in the Sino-Japanese Wars. There was two of them. And uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, they expanded their influence, their imperial power to China. 
and they committed a lot of atrocities, like I mentioned before, okay, with the, the bayonets and the lacrosse, and uh, well, we don't have to get into it anymore, right? Okay, five, Australia, the land down under, right? G'day, mate. Put another shrimp on the bar, Austria. <laughs> Griffin, go ahead. Ten. Ten, good work. Good work, kangaroos jumping around down there. And uh, what, not too long ago, there was a bunch of wildfires. Terrible, terrible things going on there not too long ago. It was unbelievable. It was environmental impacts. Yeah, Australia. So at one point, they're controlled by who? Who controlled all Australia? Go ahead. Britain. Britain. Good work. Great Britain. Nice. Nice. Okay. Six. Korea. Go ahead, uh, Troy. Four. Four. The Korean Peninsula. Good job. So they're not yet. Okay. North South Korea. Japan pretty much took them over right around the early 1900s as they're going up into China, up into Russia, uh, up into Manchuria. And the Korean Peninsula is controlled by Japan. Yep, good job. The Rocket Man's located there, right, Serene? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yep. So there you go. North. So yeah, North Korea, which we'll get to the Sea of Japan here soon, he was launching missiles into there. He thought it was just like throwing rocks in the ocean or something or in a pond. I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, it was some crazy stuff not too long ago, 2016, 2017, launching these these nukes into the ocean. I was like, what are you doing? Okay, seven, Mongolia. What do you have for Mongolia? Go ahead, Autumn. Two, yep, good job, two. Good work, Mongolia, right here underneath the Soviet Union above China. Okay, eight, Manchuria. What do you have, Forney? Three, good job, Manchuria, taken over by Japan really quick. Um, as they moved into the Korean Peninsula in the early 1900s, they just took over that land as well. Okay. Nine, Thailand. Yeah, for Thailand. What do we got here? Michaela? You have seven? You're right. Good work. Good work. What's the capital of Thailand? I'm just joking. All right, ten, French Indochina. What do we have? Modern day what? Vietnam, right? Where, what number do we have for French Indochina? Go ahead, Troy. Eight. Eight. Good job. Modern day Vietnam. Ooh. Okay. Eleven, the Philippines. What do we have, Kira? Nine. Nine. Good work. So we'll talk about that soon. Uh, General MacArthur, he acts like the Terminator. He says, I'll be back. And he does come back. And he, he smokes them pretty good. All right, label the bodies of water. See you, Japan. What letter do we have? Gracie, what letter? B. B, good job. So you can see it's between the Korean Peninsula and Japan. All right, Sea of Japan. All right, two, Yellow Sea. Jeffrey, what do you have for the Yellow C. Sea? C, good job. What's a pirate's favorite letter? R. R, don't you know it's the C? Get it? So Get it? <laughs> oh. No, no, no one get it? Okay, all right. All right, all right, okay. Some people might just go right over their heads. So just want to make sure everybody got that one. They can load it up later. They can tell your parents or your siblings or something. Just make sure you cite me, okay? I'm just going to go to the If you learned something today, I guess. Three, Pacific Ocean. What do we have? What do we have, Lentz? Hey, good work, Pacific Ocean. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, hey, Pacific Ocean. Four, Coral Sea. Coral Sea. Griffin. D, D good job. Down here, right? Coral Sea, close to the land down under. Yep. And uh, we'll talk about significant battle there at Coral Sea. All right, five, Philippine Sea. It's right next to Philippines, so we should know this morning. E. e, good job. All right, so like I said, 1942, just check. To see how much Japan has expanded by that time, and uh, I'll let you guys color that in and turn it in. So if you didn't do this, it's easy points here, and I'm going to help you with your map quiz. So maybe we'll have a map quiz by the end of the week. We'll see. So I will put that up and ready to roll for us. Okay, any questions? You guys good? All right. Good stuff, good stuff. 
All right, so today, bell ringer first. Oh, there it is. Describe the impact and significance of the Battle of Pearl Harbor. So last we left off on Friday, okay, we know that Japan was a little angry. Why? Why is Japan angry at the U.S.? I thought we helped build them up, right? We inspired industrialization into their land in the 1850s. We're kind of an ally with them in World War I. What the heck? Why this all of a sudden just go downhill, Griffin? Yeah, good job. The embargo, right? The United States said, well, they're belligerent. They're expanding too much. Some of the atrocities we've been hearing, a little crazy, which we'll talk more about. And uh, the U.S. decided we're going to cut off some trade, especially with oil, fuel. And we know Japan and Ireland, they need to expand. If they don't have any oil, how are they going to continue to grow? So they get a little angry and decide to act out, try to attack the U.S. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So Colin put up three fifteen the other day. Dang. Wow. You know what? He didn't have all that practice when he's getting pinned, when he's on his back. Oh, hey, get off me. <laughs> right? I'm just kidding. That is pretty neat, huh? Good for him. Good for him. How much does he squat? <laughs> Stick with marshmallows on it. <laughs> like uh, SpongeBob and Ellie. <sighs> he's trying to look. <sighs> he's blowing his arms up, right? Balloon arms. Okay, this one shouldn't take you too long. It's important to know the date, right? Very, very important. So what is the date of Pearl Harbor? Lens, go ahead. December 7th, 1941. December 7th, 1941. It's just like you heard it last period, or oh, first period. Yeah, yeah. December, December 7th, 1941. Date that live in infamy, FDR states. Okay, next day the U.S. will get involved in World War II. We all know that. Okay, so Pearl Harbor, devastating, 2,500 American um, American soldiers, right, get killed and uh, destroyed the Pacific Fleet out for six months. It's interesting, though. Where are the aircraft carriers? Were there any there? No, there weren't. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. It's military code to have the battleships escort the aircraft carriers. If all the battleships are at Pearl Harbor, the aircraft carriers are out in the ocean. It seems like they're prepared for this, right? It's almost like they're baiting them in. Oh, well, I'm just kidding. Uh, conspiracy theory there. Conspiracy there. I just had to state it out there, throw it out, see if anybody catches it or not. But, hey, no, we're not getting into that. We're not getting into that. So, anyway, this happens. This occurs. Japanese surprise attack early in the morning. Many of the soldiers, many of the people there are there. On the island, thought it was just a routine, a military tactic practice, you know, with the planes doing bombing runs. Okay, on some of these smaller islands right outside of where Pearl Harbor is. So they weren't too shocked about it at first. Like, ah, just a military routine, not a big deal. All of a sudden, as the planes are flying closer and closer, they're like, oh, that's a Japanese plane. Look at the red dot on it, you know, the red spot. And then destruction that followed suit, obviously, was devastating to a point where this pushed a lot of people who were isolationists to get involved. Okay, this is a total, uh, I guess you could say, united factor for the U.S. Everybody in the U.S. is like, you know what, we got to get involved now. Can't believe they would attack us. Can't believe, you know, for the first time since the War of 1812, the U.S. got attacked on home soil. I know, I know, it's not continental U.S., right? It's, but it's out in the island, but hey, that's part of the U.S., right? military base out there many soldiers many people citizens in the united states died so we had to get back at them, right we had to stop imperial japan from expanding and then eventually germany actually goes okay uh, they, they approved for warfare against us which is like wait a minute what the what? you know we're, we're just trying to fight japan here out in the pacific and then germany's going to declare war on us oh my gosh 
So then we get involved in Europe, which we'll talk more about. Okay, all right, there we go. Terms for today. A bit of them. There's quite a few, just to let you know. All right, so we have... There you go. The home front, Rosie the Riveter, not Rosie Schiano making pizzas up there, right? Uh, rationing, War Production Board, Victory Gardens, and War Bonds. Wow, there's quite a few. There's quite a few. There's quite a few. So I'll give you some time. Look up these terms. I'll go over them with you, and uh, we'll discuss it. So I guess when you're looking up the term, type in the home front, World War II. There you go. <clears throat> All right, okay, what do we got for the home front? World War II in America. What do we have here? What do we have? Serene, what do you got for the home front? I have, uh, I'm going to use this show to show we had front against enemy. Yeah, all right, good job. So the home front, uh, definitely a term that's very significant and impactful, okay, especially for the United States moving into World War II. Is up to many American citizens. 
materials they need to keep fighting. Okay, war supplies, armaments. Okay, many of these industries and factories throughout this time uh, transitioned to creating war armaments. Okay, no longer is it peacetime um, supplies and items. And we know America was going through the Great Depression, so many of these industries, factories, businesses were all closed down. But now all of a sudden, let's get it going. Let's get it rolling. Okay. And uh, this gave a lot of prosperity to many Americans, pulled us out of this Great Depression, right like that. And we were using these factories and businesses that were shut down for a bit of time. And maybe that were still going and uh, made war products out of it, and armaments, you name it. Okay, Rosie the Riveter. Who is this? Who is this? Jeffrey, who's Rosie the Riveter? She's the mascot for the home front. Yeah, okay, good job. Using a lot of propaganda pieces, which I'm sure you guys have saw it all. The, the girl with uh, her arm, she's flexing, right? Okay, I'll show that tomorrow in the PowerPoint. I just want to get through these terms. But a riveter, what is a riveter? If you guys don't know it, what is that? Lent, you know these. A rivet gun, right? Yeah, so to help, obviously, with creating different types of item or war armaments, especially with planes and everything, there's rivet guns into different things they call it Rosie the Riveter. So this was aimed for women to get involved in a war effort and a war production. Okay. As the men were going to fight overseas again, right? Since uh, since World War One happened, now World War Two. It was up for the women to step up and you know help out. Okay. It didn't have to be in the industries and the factories. I know many areas around here they created parachutes, different types of uniforms. Okay, I'm not sure particular here, but where I live in Valley View, there's many areas where my grandmother told me she worked to create parachutes and different types of uniforms and, you know, helping with bags, things like that. And it was interesting, like these small, uh, I guess you call it sweatshops, right? These sewing, you know, places of, of sewing and creating clothing and, and, uh, and uh, you know, articles and materials of clothing. It was interesting, right? So it didn't have to be constantly equipment or, you know, supplies and armaments like that, but you know, just clothing and parachutes. It was pretty neat when she was describing me and picking it out when we drive down to the uh, grocery store. She's like, oh, right here is where I worked during World War II. Okay, I was, she was, I don't know, probably like 18, 17 at the time. And she was making these parachutes and sewing them together. And it was pretty cool to hear. So you have an older family member, ask them. I'm sure Mr. Henninger knows a lot of these areas around this, you know, in Eville and Lycans maybe and, Marysburg, wherever it might be, and talk about these certain locations where it was maybe changed and altered for war production. Pretty cool stuff. Not saying that he's an old old guy there, but local history, right? Local history, you should know these areas. Rationing. What do we have here? Go ahead, Forney. Uh, Americans were sacrifices and money raised by rationing uh, goods such as gasoline, butter, sugar, and canned milk uh, because they were needed. The yeah, good job. Good job. All right. So hopefully you guys are writing stuff down here to aid you with these terms because these are pretty much the notes in the study guide. So yeah, rationing, okay, anything really. Okay. When it came down to crops, when it came down to different materials like metals, okay, rubber especially was uh, a resource that was kind of recycled to use for, uh, for the war effort. And there's many locations set up all throughout communities to kind of give these resources and materials to in order to support the war effort. I know at local high schools and local schools around the area, they would come and you know throw these old tires or you know old metals or different types of items, okay, for that war effort. It's interesting to how everybody at home was really supporting and trying to benefit the war effort for America's side and it's, it's pretty cool how that all kind of kind of came about right not not only just people that were involved in the war but citizens civilians children women okay they, they all did their part all right so rationing definitely an important uh, part they even had ration cards where people would kind of go around and have these ration cards you just send out and explain what kind of items that they need to okay here's the location dumping off you know, we're collecting rubber at the high school today, so if you want to come down, you know, come in, you know, donate rubber. And it, was, it was neat stuff. All right, War Production Board, what do we got? Troy, what do you have for the War Production Board? Yeah, good job. So established pretty much right after Pearl Harbor. 
right, not too long after. And they advised many of these industries and factories to help support the war. One of the biggest ones, okay, these car dealerships, these car production, like Ford, okay. Do uh, you guys ever see the movie Ford versus Ferrari? No, it's a really good movie. Troy, you'd like that, right? You like Fords. Yeah, you should check that one out. Okay, it actually talks about during World War II and how they really just transitioned to create different types of bombers and planes, okay, from cars to planes. It was interesting. And uh, the Ford Mustang, not named after a horse, is actually named after the B-52 Mustang, which is a plane during World War II. It was pretty neat. It's interesting how that all came about. But not only Ford, but many of these other industries and other factories and businesses all trying to transition their products of peacetime to wartime. And Ford especially, they're pumping out a B-52 bomber within an hour. An hour, that's crazy. And the assembly line, obviously different products and, and uh, many workers helping to uh, obviously uh, build these planes in fast-paced time. It was just a crazy how much the United States could produce compared to all other countries throughout the world. Okay, I'll have to look at the statistics, but it was just... It was no match, right? The United States industries, resources, raw materials that they had and we have in our country, right? Okay, and, and uh, these, 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 these industries and all these businesses that we had, it was just an unmatched uh, what we could produce. And that was really our claim to fame. That was really what won us this war. We had so many supplies and armaments and we weren't affected by the war like everybody else throughout the world. Yeah, Pearl Harbor got... You know, the one of it, but for the most part, we could continue to produce and manufacture goods, and it was just amazing what we could pump out. Yep, so War Production Board, <clears throat> in short terms, that trans transitioned many of these peacetime industries and factories to uh, alter to change for wartime. Okay, and Ford, Ford Motors is definitely one that, that transitioned for the war effort. It was amazing, it, it actually saved. It actually saved the, the company. All right, Victory Gardens. What do we got? Victory Gardens. Gracie, what do you have for Victory Gardens? Yeah, good job. So this is kind of a repeating term, these last two ones. Well, I guess the other ones as well. But Victory Gardens especially, uh, this was advising citizens, people all throughout the United States to grow crops, to grow different, uh, have a garden at their home and uh, utilize the food that they can grow uh, because every source of food can be sent to soldiers and troops. It was almost kind of piggybacking off of what rationing is, right? Kiara, you got that? All right, war bonds. What are war bonds? Kira, what I have for war bonds? Yeah, good job. So these are pretty much just like a, a way of investing for the U.S. to grow their military power. So you buy these bonds, and over time, obviously, that was able to purchase and buy and, and create uh, more businesses to support the war effort at, on the home front. Okay, so you're almost like investing in the military if you're buying these war bonds where they can use that money that you purchase that war bond off of and you know, help create more industries and factories and help supply the soldiers overseas. All right. Hey, we'll see you guys later. So that, that happened on World War One as well, but it was a way of form of propaganda to support the U.S. through these, these uh, conflicts. Okay, see you guys.